All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for having me. Uh, and welcome to my talk. Uh, it's called The Attacker Perspective, Insights from Hacking Alibaba Cloud's Internal Kubernetes Environment. Uh, and the story I'm going to tell you here today is kind of a unique uh, story in the KubeCon view. Because I'm not going to tell a Kubernetes story from the point of view of like a developer or a DevOps person or any of these things, but from the opposite point of view. Uh, how me, uh, as a hacker, uh, is looking on Kubernetes environments, like real-life Kubernetes environments of Alibaba Cloud, uh, and trying to basically uh, hack them, break them. Uh, and specifically, uh, how uh, we were able to start from a database instance uh, on Alibaba Cloud that belonged to us, contained uh, our own data only. Uh, from there, we were able to gain control over the entire Kubernetes cluster uh, and gain access to all the other customers' databases uh, that use the same service on Alibaba Cloud. And not only that, but also we were able to gain right access to Alibaba's internal container registry containing all their uh, images for different cloud services as well. Uh, poison their images with whatever you know, malicious code that we wanted to uh, insert into there and have that code execute on all the other customers' databases as well and on other cloud services on Alibaba Cloud too. So how do we do it? Uh, what sort of mistakes and bugs were we able to uh, exploit here to get this crazy level of privilege? And, and most importantly, how can you guys prevent yourselves from doing the similar mistakes uh, when building these sort of services? Uh, let's dive right in. Uh, this is before we do. Uh, allow me to introduce myself. Uh, my name is uh, Eli Ben Sasson. I'm also here on behalf of my teammate, uh, Renan Schustin. He couldn't be here uh, with us, but he did a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I am, uh, my name is Eli Ben Sasson, as I said. Uh, my Twitter handle is very conveniently just at Eli. Uh, so uh, if you want to uh, hit me up there, I post uh, cool research stuff from time to time. You're also very welcome to uh, slide into my DMs. Uh, I am 24 years old, uh, based in Israel. Um, very proud to be. Jewish and very proud to be Israeli, uh, especially during these tough times. Uh, and I am a security researcher as part of the Wiz research team. Uh, what we do is basically cloud security related research, uh, which uh, translated means uh, a lot of the time working with uh, real life, uh, big and complex um, Kubernetes and Docker based environments uh, in lots of different cloud services and cloud providers, such as Alibaba Cloud. Uh, Alibaba Cloud uh, is the biggest cloud provider in the uh, Asia Pacific region and also generally a very big cloud provider. Uh, and just like the other cloud providers that you guys might know, Alibaba Cloud also offers a wide variety of managed database services to its customers. They come in all uh, shapes, sizes, colors, and flavors. Uh, in this particular research, we decided to focus on a particular one of them called Postgres SQL. Uh, Postgres SQL is a database, it's we chose that one because it's a very complex and feature-rich database. And uh, on our experience, we found it to be uh, relatively easy to exploit to gain code execution. Uh, basically, uh, what we found on previous cloud providers uh, when working with Postgres SQL is that uh, it's basically an open source project for databases that is inherently designed for on-premise environments. And when all these cloud providers try to like, modify it in order to be a uh, cloud-based, uh, service-based solution. Uh, they did these sort of similar patterns of mistakes that we were able to exploit uh, in many different cloud providers. If you're interested in learning more about those particular vulnerabilities, uh, there is a link at the bottom of the slide. Uh, we have a very detailed uh, blog about these vulnerabilities, and we also had a uh, Black Hat talk uh, about this, which is uh, quite interesting uh, if uh, that's what you're into. Uh, so uh, we're not going to talk about that today. We're going to talk about Kubernetes, but uh, just know that this is the reason uh, we chose Postgres. Uh, so Postgres SQL is offered by two uh, database services in Alibaba Cloud. One of them is called AnalyticDB, which is sort of like the big data uh, service that Alibaba provides. And other one is called AppSeraDB, uh, RDS, which is just a regular uh, database service. So let's talk about AnalyticDB and how we basically, how we hack that service. Uh, so uh, we started out by creating a new database on our account uh, and basically uh, started looking for these you know, vulnerabilities that I just talked about, these mistakes, uh, until we were able to gain code execution uh, on, those data on one of these databases. And the first thing we asked ourselves after we gained code execution is, OK, we're running code on something. Where exactly are we running? What sort of infrastructure does the database have? We're running code on something somewhere, but what exactly is the underlying infrastructure? So we start you know, looking at the file system, the processes, the network, et cetera, et cetera, uh, until we figure out uh, that this is a Kubernetes environment. Uh, our uh, database instance runs on a Kubernetes pod, which, of course, begs the question, how can we actually escape that pod? We don't want to be you know, chained. We don't want to be in the matrix. We want to break out of jail and see what actually happens uh, on the infrastructure of what we're doing. Uh, so how do we break out of prison? 
Uh, basically, whenever we try to escape uh, out of containers, we try to look for these similar patterns of mistakes that people usually make when configuring uh, Docker containers that we can uh, exploit in order to break out. So one of the popular things that we would be looking for, for example, is high permissions within the container. Uh, like what sort of permissions and uh, Linux capabilities maybe does our user have that we can uh, try to exploit. So in this case, we did not run as root. We ran as a user called admin. It was quite frankly, just a weak user. It was kind of a loser. It didn't have access to anything interesting. Uh, it didn't have any sort of permissions or capabilities that we were able to exploit. So that one was kind of a, a hit on the wall. Uh, the other thing we try to look for is any sort of shared namespaces. Uh, do we have a PAD namespace, a mountain namespace, a network namespace that we share with anything else that we can try to uh, exploit for our own good? Uh, in this case, we had none. <laughs> so nothing. Uh, this was also uh, quite of a dead end. Another thing that we try to look for is any sort of shared uh, resources. Uh, and in this case, we actually found a persistent volume storage, uh, which was our home directory. It was slash home slash ADBP admin. Uh, this was a persistent volume storage. And uh, this was uh, th the first maybe interesting find that we found, but it wasn't that interesting. Uh, because that folder was not a particularly interesting folder. It was just our home directory. It mostly contained uh, the Postgres SQL data, our own database data, uh, which had to be persistent because you know that's the service, but it didn't actually give us anything meaningful. So we at this point, we looked at this list that you're seeing behind me, and we tried to ask ourselves, we took like a hard look at the mirror and tried to ask ourselves, so what do we have here? Uh, and ultimately, the answer was nothing. We didn't really have anything interesting. As you can see here, our user is weak. We do not have any shared namespaces. We only have like one persistent volume storage that we don't really have anything to do without. So we really did have nothing on our hands at this point. Uh, so we decided to go back to the drawing board and do what any good security researcher does best. Uh, and don't tell anyone because it's sort of a trade secret, but what a good security researcher does a big percentage of the time is just click on random buttons until something interesting pops up. So we decided to do just that. Uh, we went back to the Alibaba management console. As you can see, there are a lot of buttons going around. So we decided to just click all of the buttons until something interesting will inevitably pop up. And then something interesting popped up. Uh, this uh, toggle that you see here is labeled uh, SSL encryption. Uh, and right as we saw that, that looked really interesting to us because SSL encryption implies uh, there, that ha there has to be some sort of SSL certificate being installed. The certificate is a file. And when you do all these actions with files, you open up lots of interesting attack surfaces like uh, symlink attacks, like file system permissions, all these sorts of stuff. This looked like an interesting direction to us. So uh, we clicked on that toggle and we clicked OK. And suddenly, bam. All sorts of interesting stuff started to happen within our container. All these new processes started popping up. Uh, so we were like, OK, uh, stuff is happening. That's very exciting. What exactly is happening? Uh, so let's go over these processes uh, one by one. First process we see here is run C init, which is very exciting because it means a new container uh, is being created, uh, is being spawned, uh, which is always, uh, always exciting to see. Uh, but why exactly do we see that process here? It's a different container. Why exactly do we actually see the run C command? Well, the answer is that it must mean that we share this MPID namespace because we can see all the processes that are running within that container. It means that our container and that new container being spawned share a PID namespace. Great. Let's move on to the second one. The second one is a Python script that is being run from that new container. Uh, it's running from uh, a script that is on slash opt. But when we wanted to see that script, we went to slash opt, and that script was never there. Quite weird. What does that mean? Uh, well, that means that we have a different mount namespace. Uh, our containers slash opt and that new container slash opt are different folders. Uh, we cannot see that script. That means we have different mount namespace. Cool. Moving on. Third uh, command being run is making a new directory under our home directory, under home pgadmin. And when we looked at that folder, we saw that the folder was indeed created, which means we have the same slash home slash admin, which means we have a shared volume. That's exciting. We have something, uh, another thing in common with that new, uh, with that new container. That's cool. Uh, and finally, the last command that this uh, script runs is the scp command. Uh, this command actually does not run as root. It runs as us. It runs as the adbpg admin user. OK, so scp, what the hell is that? So scp stands for uh, secure copy protocol. Basically, it's a utility for transferring files over an SSH connection between uh, machines. That's how Alibaba chose to uh, move the certificate from their machine to ours. Uh, and this was interesting to us because we thought, OK, if there is an SSH connection being created, then uh, SSH will have to read the SSH configuration. But because this runs as our user, not as root, then the SSH configuration will be loaded from our home directory, slash home slash admin. So we can write an SSH configuration. The SCP will load it, and it will listen to everything that happens inside it. So we're like, OK, 
we might control an SSH configuration. What can we do with that? So ask ourselves all these you know, theories. Maybe we can add a new library and do some sort of uh, SO hijacking thing, inject ourselves to the SSS pro SSHD process, et cetera, et cetera. But in reality, there's just a configuration called local command. It takes a command and it runs it, <laughs> which is very, very convenient. Uh, shout out to uh, OpenSSH for that amazing uh, configuration option. So basically, we added this uh, to our config file. And then uh, whenever SCP runs and loads that configuration, our command will be executed. So a little recap. We had our own container, the Postgres SQL container. Right nearby that, we had uh, the Alibaba management container. Uh, both of those share the same home directory and PID namespace. Uh, whenever that container will uh, go to run the SCP command on our container, it will load our malicious SSH configuration, and bam, now we're running code on the Alibaba management container as well. So what does this management container actually contain? Uh, we're on a new machine. Uh, we try to figure out uh, what exactly we're looking at here. We try to look at, you know, uh, files, processes, whatever. In this case, mostly files, because that's the, uh, the thing that was different between the two containers. And imagine our surprise when we came across the slash run directory and saw this file right here, docker.sock. We all know Docker. Uh, how Docker works uh, behind the scenes is basically uh, you have the Docker API. It uh, listens in to get these, uh, all these commands like you know, uh, run, uh, create a new container, create a new image, spawn a new blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it listens to these commands and performs them. Uh, it can listen on either a TCP connection or a Unix socket, which is a file just like this one, docker.sock, uh, which means if we have access to write to that file, we can write Docker API commands, and the Docker API is supposed to run them. So we're like, OK, fantastic. Let's create a new, let's send a command to Docker API asking the Docker API to run a new privileged container on the host. Run our own commands on a new privileged container. Uh, would that work? Well, it did. <laughs> we ran a command. Uh, we were able to uh, get a new privileged container and we got a reverse shell back uh, from the Kubernetes node itself. We got a new scary error message saying that it's like a production server. Uh, so seems like we were successful. Let's have a little recap again uh, on how we escaped uh, that Kubernetes node. We started out with executing code on our own database, our own PostgreSQL instance. From there, we were able to spread to this uh, neighbor container, the Alibaba management container, through the SCP trick. Uh, from there, we were able to access the Docker API, create a new privileged container. And once we were a privileged container, we had access to run code over the, enti the entire Kubernetes node. Cool. So now we control the Kubernetes node. What exactly is on that Kubernetes node? So we started looking around and we realized that uh, this node did not contain anything besides our own data in it. We didn't see any evidence for other customers' data, which means that on this service, uh, each customer database runs on a different Kubernetes node. Basically, this is the way for Alibaba to separate between uh, different customers. Uh, so that means that even after we did all this escape and we control the entire Kubernetes node, we still don't have any direct access to other customers' data. Or do we? So it's worth noting that if you're using Kubernetes uh, for a separation of nodes, uh, there is still one thing that uh, keeps them together, although they're theoretically separate, which is Kubernetes itself. Kubernetes uh, links all these nodes together through the Kubernetes API, which sort of complicates your you know, tenant isolation architecture. Uh, so we have to ask us, OK, we're a node in a Kubernetes cluster. We have a service account. What exactly can a service account do? So we tried uh, listing the pods, and immediately we saw that something was fishy because we did not only see our own pods, but we also saw other customers' pods as well. Uh, so we realized, okay, this might be a strong service account. What else can we do? Uh, besides seeing the pods, we were also able to see all the images that we used to create all those pods, basically all the, uh, the, the templates uh, used to create them. Uh, and the more interesting thing is that all these images used the same uh, secret, a Docker image pool secret, uh, there were basically the credentials uh, for Docker to log into the container registry and fetch images. Uh, so we had access to that secret, meaning we had credentials to log into Alibaba's internal Docker container registry. So we were like, okay, we have credentials to the Docker registry. What sort of credentials are they exactly? So we decided to uh, check uh, what sort of access token we get when using these credentials. Uh, we got this access token. And if you have very sharp vision uh, from right there in the crowd, you might notice uh, that this token did not only allow pull, but also push permissions meaning that we can push, we can take our own images and push them into the internal container registry uh, and basically poison every single image, internal image on Alibaba Cloud, whether it be our own service, different services, insert whatever you know, malware or custom code that we want to run, and every single image on Alibaba Cloud, every single container on Alibaba Cloud that is created from that image will run our own code in it. Okay, a little recap. It's gonna be a nice video. 
nice visualization. So uh, we started out us as an attacker with our own PostgreSQL instance. Uh, we managed to run code on that uh, with the PostgreSQL uh, vulnerability. And from there, we were able to escape uh, to the underlying node, run code on the underlying Kubernetes node. Once we had access to that node, we had access to communicate with the Kubernetes API server. So we managed to fetch uh, the Docker image pull secret. Using that secret, we connected to uh, Alibaba's internal Docker container registry, and we were able to push our own malicious image. And then that image would be pulled by every other analytic DB on Alibaba. And not only that, it will also be pulled by a myriad of other Alibaba services. For example, AppServerDB that we talked about will also pull their images from our uh, control registry, and we will be able to basically run our own arbitrary code on every single one of them. All right. <laughs> so we talked about analytic DB. Let's also talk a little bit about AppSera DB, the other uh, database service that Alibaba provides. <laughs> so AppSera DB RDS, uh, how are we able to escape from that one too? So it was kind of similar, but uh, also not. Uh, we started out with the same, you know, same exact vulnerability. We were able to run code on our uh, PostgreSQL instance. From there, we were able to similarly escape to a Alibaba management container. However, this time, this management container was in itself a privileged Docker container. So we didn't have to do you know, any extra steps. We were already privileged, so we were able to take over the entire Kubernetes node. Uh, so now we're on a different Kubernetes node. It's a different service, so it's a different infrastructure, and we start to look around, trying to figure out, you know, what does this node have? What exactly does it control? Uh, and imagine our surprise uh, when we looked around and saw tons of other customers' databases on the exact same node, meaning that on AppSeraDB, Alibaba does not separate between customers' node. It only uh, separates between pods. So as a minute, the minute that we managed to escape to the Kubernetes node, we, already, we were already able to access other customers' databases. So uh, those are basically uh, the vulnerabilities we, that we found in uh, both PostgreSQL services and Alibaba Cloud. We reported all of them uh, to Alibaba. They responded very uh, professionally, and they applied multiple fixes. First of all, they fixed all the uh, vulnerabilities and misconfigurations that we just talked about, uh, obviously. Uh, they also, uh, interestingly, uh, created a new uh, internal internally developed uh, safe container technology, similar to Google's Gvisor, uh, but an Alibaba internal one. Uh, they applied it to all those containers uh, as a manner to harden them, basically make it harder for people to escape out of those containers. Uh, and finally, they also restricted and scoped uh, the node's permission, the service account's permission within the uh, Kubernetes cluster, and also obviously the uh, container registry permissions so that people uh, won't have write access anymore. Uh, right. Let's talk a little bit about what went wrong here exactly. What sort of mistakes and bugs were we able to exploit here in order to get these permissions? The first mistake that uh, happened here is, first of all, the unsafe namespace sharing between uh, our container and the other container. Uh, basically, whenever you share a network namespace, a PID namespace, a mount namespace uh, between a weaker container and a stronger container, you're inherently weakening the container security because you're uh, making the attack surface bigger. Uh, whenever you intervene with on a container, you should know that's obviously a risky thing to do. You should do it with uh, extreme caution and with low privileges as possible. Uh, the second mistake happening here is using the container as the sole security barrier between uh, customers' data, between different tenants. Uh, whenever you use container as a security barrier, you should be aware of what exactly is needed for an attacker to bypass that security barrier. When you're using containers, uh, you're first of all prone to any sort of misconfiguration or unsafe resource sharing, uh, which is exactly what you saw here today. Uh, but not only that, it's also worth mentioning that uh, when you're using container as a security mechanism, you're also exposed to any Linux kernel vulnerabilities. Uh, because Linux kernel is the one that is responsible for uh, basically enforcing uh, those policies, uh, that means that whenever there is an Linux kernel vulnerability, or one day uh, that is not that uncommon in today's world, uh, whenever you manage to run code on the kernel, you're also able to escape from the container. So all the attacker needs to do to bypass that security barrier is one of those two things. Uh, so it's worth mentioning, uh, worth mentioning that when choosing security barriers, what exactly is needed for a skilled attacker to bypass them, which is, in that case, not necessarily that much. Uh, third thing went wrong here is the strong Docker registry credentials, which also had uh, write permissions. Uh, it's worth mentioning when you create a secret that is uh, that powerful that any service account that has, you know, secrets permissions, pod permissions within the uh, Kubernetes environment can potentially obtain them. Uh, and whenever it's obtained, they can pose uh, kind of unique risk that crosses different environments 
because uh, you know both uh, production environment, dev environment, build, test, and even developers' workstations, all those people are pulling images in order to work. So whenever you can uh, control a uh, internal container registry, uh, it allows you to spread within all these different environments, uh, which normally an attacker wouldn't be able to do so easily. Uh, if you're interested in uh, tent isolation in general, uh, there's a great resource that I highly recommend. It's called Peach. Uh, it's basically an open source framework uh, that is used for modeling and improvement, tent isolation, and SaaS and PaaS applications. Uh, it was developed with the help of excellent people from great companies such as yourself, so contributions are always appreciated. Uh, if you're uh, working with multi-tenant environments or even creating multi-tenant environments, I think it's a very good uh, resource to consult with in order to make sure that you're uh, separating things properly. Uh, and also, if you know things that uh, we don't, then uh, contributions are very appreciated. It's available at uh, peach.wiz.io if you're interested in reading more. If you're interested in uh, this research more, uh, just know that basically well, what I told you here today was kind of just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, we have a very detailed blog about uh, all the uh, vulnerabilities and stuff that I didn't even uh, get to touch on. Uh, on uh, it's called Broken Sesame. It's the top QR code here. Uh, and if you're uh, and if you like that, then we also had a very similar research on IBM Cloud on a different cloud provider where we also were able to do some sort of supply chain poisoning. That's the bottom QR code uh, right here. Uh, highly recommended uh, read. Broken Sesame and Hell's Keychain. All right, uh, let's sum things up with some takeaways. First of all, uh, it's worth noting that whenever you introduce uh, Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes cluster, Kubernetes uh, pods to a multi-tenant environment, it sort of complicates your security model because it provides additional attack surface. Uh, it provides uh, the attacker with access to stuff like uh, identity, service accounts, shared resources, network resources uh, that, are all, that are always uh, uh, better for you know, expanding your attack surface. Uh, so it's not, it doesn't mean that you should never introduce Kubernetes to a multi-tent uh, security environment, but you should be aware of the risk that it poses uh, the, and the new attack surface that it creates. Uh, the second thing is that containers uh, should never be the sole security barrier. It should never be the only line of defense uh, because it can be broken with, as we saw today, stuff that doesn't necessarily require a super skilled attacker. It can be a line of defense, but it shouldn't be the only one. And another thing that is worth mentioning that is whenever you use containers as a security barrier, you should uh, definitely take a look into safe container technologies. Google has a, uh, a, very, uh, a very good project, in my opinion, called uh, GVisor. Uh, it's basically uh, sort of a safe container solution to help make a very hardened container, stuff that is uh, much harder to escape from than uh, a non-hardened one. Uh, so if you're using containers as a security barrier, you might as well make them hardened. Uh, and finally, this is sort of a uh, generic takeaway, but it's also very relevant here. Uh, pen test your internal environments. Uh, assume that people win gate access to uh, customer pods and start to work your way up from there to start uh, to try to see what attackers will, might be able to see. Uh, let's hope that it won't be an access to overwrite every single image on your internal container registry. All right. Thank you very much. Any questions? Thank you. Uh, if anyone has any questions, you can ah, you can go to the uh, the microphone. Just out of curiosity, why was the Docker socket available in that image that you uh, that you were shared with? Like, uh, that's a good question. Uh, I, I can't really explain the why because you know I didn't really build that environment. But uh, I think that because it was so many hops inside, it was a more trusted you know environment. Uh, like in the second case, it was even more of a trusted environment because even the management container wasn't itself privileged. Uh, you know, it was. Uh, I think that uh, lots of times people assume that as as long as uh, your uh, the stuff you're building is more internal, is more uh, business internal, then it won't be. It doesn't have to be as hardened. Uh, but that's always a mistake because it's you know it's always barriers upon barriers, right? Uh, whenever the first barrier is broken and you get to the second one, then you have to make new defenses. Uh, so I can only assume that's the why. When you pushed to ECR, was there no audit that would have caught that unauthorized access? Um, that's a good question. Um, we did not obviously push any sort of malware. We just uh, basically we just tested uh, our login and managed to managed to see that our token had uh, pull, uh, push access. Uh, we later talked to Alibaba, and they confirmed that it was indeed uh, push access like, just like we thought. We were able to operate all the files, but we didn't actually uh, try to do that in real life because that would be, uh, you know, that, that, that might be actually dangerous, and we don't want to damage the, uh, the actual production environment of Alibaba. Uh, but yeah, uh, they also, interestingly enough, uh, they said uh, that during our research, uh, there was um, some sort of uh, alert going on on a very specific part of the uh, intervention, which was the... Uh, uh, the Postgres SQL 
uh, code execution, uh, they said that this is the part that they noticed. Uh, when we uh, started doing basically our entire, uh, our entire thing there, but we got rid of that pretty quickly. Uh, like even after running code on the Postgres, we uh, managed to go to, you know, to the Nod, to, to uh, sorry, to the other container and to uh, the Kubernetes Nod. So we didn't really uh, need that afterwards, but they said that this, this was the part that they noticed uh, internally. Thank you. Thank you. And you mentioned uh, you did it quick, pretty quickly, but like how quickly? Is it like days, hours? Uh, uh, not hours, uh, but yeah, it was, uh, it was days, pretty much. It was like, uh, I think, uh, like uh, a week, plus minus, yeah, that entire like uh, story. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, a great talk. Uh, Thank you. You did mention that there was an alert, right? Uh, what would have the incident responders do that would have stopped you? Like, they got the alert now. Could they have taken your role? I, I don't know. Like, you have already controlled the Kubernetes cluster. So what action could they have taken to kind of break your uh, steps? Thank you. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I think that uh, when, it, when they said that what they noticed was the uh, Postgres SQL code execution, that, uh, that means that they can fix it. You know, they can uh, try to, and they did fix it uh, eventually, of course. Uh, you could try to, you know, limit the Postgres SQL permissions. You could try to even close the code execution uh, vulnerability entirely. Uh, but the thing is that at that point, uh, whenever you, uh, you know, at that point that uh, they noticed us, at this point we were all the pretty deep in, right? We managed to get rid of the Postgres SQL as a necessity because we were all the running on the node. Uh, so at that point, I think the smartest thing to do is after, you know, you, you patch the vulnerability and you maybe close the access to actually try to uh, consult your uh, IR solutions to see what sort of stuff do we manage to do after running code in the Postgres SQL because uh, it's naive to think that whenever this, this first line of defense is breached, that this is the last thing we did, right? Uh, we must have done something else. So if they were able to see all the commands that we run and all the things that we move laterally, uh, they were able to maybe catch up uh, the stuff that we did after and try to close all the rest of the stuff that we did after this. I don't know if they were uh, able to get to that conclusion before we reported it to them, because in this case we reported it to them. Uh, but it's a good question on what happens when, you know, when a bad guy does this. How, they, how will they be able to track the uh, process that happens after Postgres? Because Postgres is not, is not enough to close just this one vulnerability. So interesting, uh, interesting discussion there. Hey. Um, I've got a question that sort of Postgres extended where you've got a, basically a single tenant service that you're scaling to multi-tenants. Yeah. And what's the best practice for isolation? So clearly pod-based isolation, unless if you really know what you're doing and are also lucky, that's a dangerous path. Uh, Node-based isolation, um, also you pointed out, has problems. Separate clusters, separate projects if you're on a hyperscaler and like separate GCP projects, or, or where do you... Where do you think that line is on, on where the isolation should be? Uh, that's a good question. I think that whenever you introduce like a, a security barrier or sort of a, uh, you know, something that separates between something and another, uh, you need, what you need to think is what, uh, what is needed to break that isolation? Because there are, there's always something that you can do to break that isolation. If it's a Kubernetes cluster, then you would have to you know, have permissions within the Kubernetes cluster. You have to have a, a privileged service account, et cetera, et cetera. If it's, uh, for example, a, a, an actual VM, right, a virtual machine, then you, uh, it's, not un, it's still not unbreakable. You would just have to have a guest to host uh, vulnerability. Uh, which is, might be harder to, to find than a uh, Linux kernel vulnerability just by judging what days that are coming out. Uh, and even if you have, you know, let's go for the craziest part, you have two uh, physical machines that are connected, you know, actual uh, pizza boxes connected to, uh, uh, you know, sockets. Uh, even then you would have probably some sort of network access between them. Even then you could, you know, I don't know, uh, plug USB uh, into one of them, right? Uh, but I think that what you have to uh, consider is like, uh, how hard would you want it to be for an attacker to uh, break out? And what exactly does an attacker need to have in order to break out? Because there will, all be, there will always be something. It will either be a Linux kernel vulnerability, it will either be a misconfiguration, a guest to host vulnerability, et cetera, et cetera. And as long as you go further deep, it will, might be more hard to maintain and more costly, but it will also be harder to break off, right? And that's, I think, the trade-off, like the cat and mouse game here. Thank you. Thank you. Just a little continuation on the, the monitoring uh, yeah. question there. So you, you mentioned, obviously, it's important to, to follow up on that stuff. Um, but any sort of guidelines surrounding that, you know, as far as, you know, are there, do we know if there are, you know, projects within CNCF or anything else kind of, you know, you know inevitably we will screw up, you know, the configuration and everything else, right? So it's good to have best practices. But, 
you know, can we attack it from both sides and say, well, you know, we're going to do the best to configure it, but we're also going to make sure that we're, you know, monitoring and have the observability in place so that we, you know, because you would notice that they saw it, but it didn't sound like they had enough in place to really maybe see it fast enough or follow through, right? So any recommendations from that end that are more kind of, you know, standardized or tools, um, aside from just, you know, uh, do it better? <laughs> Uh, that's a great question, honestly. Uh, I think that w generally in security, when you try to build a secure environment, you have to do both things, right? You have to uh, both prevent and also, like, uh, both prevent and monitor. Uh, you want to prevent by building, uh, I think that uh, framework, the Peach framework, is a great resource for, for preventing, for designing, like, better, more secure systems. Uh, but in, uh, in, addition to, uh, in addition to that, you also have to monitor uh, very well. Uh, and I think uh, in this case, uh, the stuff that I, I don't have like a specific tool in mind, but I think in this case, uh, the sort of stuff that would have maybe caught us is uh, both uh, stuff that uh, monitors of like processes being created. Uh, like if you had like, for example, a log of every single, you know, process being created, you might have seen like all the stuff that we were running on the container. Uh, another thing that might have uh, like caught the eye of someone is, uh, you know, network based, uh, network based uh, monitoring because uh, we did make, you know, network connections. We did make, uh, in our case, you know, reverse shells, and you suddenly see, you know, a reverse shell coming out of the Postgres uh, instance, but then again, you see it uh, coming out of the management container, and then you see another reverse shell coming out of the Kubernetes cluster, uh, the Kubernetes node, uh, sorry. Uh, so network-based uh, detection would probably caught what we were doing as well. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have, like, a tool off the top of my, uh, off the top of my head, but it's both important to, as you said, uh, both monitor and uh, protect and defend. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you very much. If you have any other questions, feel free to just come up uh, or like send me a message on Twitter, whatever you, uh, <laughs> whatever you feel more comfortable. Uh, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it.